you have to hold your breath. <laughs> Uh, Josh, thanks so much for being here and thanks so much for writing this book. Um, I'm, it shook up my life and I'm very excited to have you here to, uh, hopefully shake up a few thousand, few hundred thousand more lives. Well, I, uh, when I signed a book, I sometimes, if I, if I have the time and ambition, I, I, I sign it. I hope you have as much fun reading this as I did writing it. And that's the fact. I, I just, I really did have a blast. Uh, doing that. And uh, so uh, I figured, you know, whatever happened, uh, I had a I had a good time. And apparently other people are having a good time reading it. So that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I have the exact same philosophy. Um, it, it both uh, fired, it, it excited me to, to learn all these things. Um, but it also fired me up and gave me a little bit of uh, I don't know. It gave me hunger to, to change things and like anger at the past as well. So, um, it, it wasn't all like, you know, puppies and rainbows in there. It kind of, um, give me some sadness about how things have unfolded over the last 50 years. Um, but also a lot of optimism about where we might go in the next 50. Well, yeah, I, I to some extent I, I, I share that, but in a slightly longer view, you realize that, uh, the industrial revolution, per se, was uh, a major good time in human history. And um, I, there's lots of human history where uh, things weren't being even nearly as nice as they are now, So, or progress, or, or whatever you want to call it. So um, it, to some extent, there, there was a bit of a reversion to the mean um, in, you know, over the past 50 years. Uh, everywhere except, for example, computers, communications, um, and so forth. But all the stuff that we thought was going to happen uh, coming out of the, the war of the 40s, the 50s, and uh, the 60s, like space travel, um, just, you know, collapsed on us. Um, and it wasn't that it was technologically impossible, because look what they're doing now. Um, mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, uh, it was it was just a loss of interest, and I think there was a loss of interest in a lot of the other things um, that we expected then, and uh, we could have gotten. Uh, but people, you know, they they went off and wanted to do other things, and and a lot of them. I, I mean, I I call it virtue signaling. It, it's because it's not things I wanted, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I have theories about it, and, and they're theories. I'm not an expert on how, how the human race works, but, you know, anybody can at least sit there and, and a cat can look at a king and, uh, and, you know, take your best shot. And so some of that's in the book. Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought it was a very interesting mix of, you know, your deep scientific background and sort of some, uh, yeah, theories about, about the social movements or... Um, social cruft or timeless, you know, foibles of humanity that contribute to whether science continues or, and how it continues and unfolds. And I thought that was some of the really, some of the most interesting stuff um, is, you know, almost psychologically getting out of our own way to, to let technology sort of do what it can do. Yeah. Well, I, I was a bit surprised when I was writing that I kept going back to uh, HG Wells again and again. Um, <laughs> he was, he was actually, uh, he's, probably not uh, too well remembered anymore, except for War of the Worlds. But uh, around the turn of the, the previous turn of the century, um, the, uh, you know, he had just written The Time Machine and The War of the Worlds and um, a, a long nonfiction book about, it was called Anticipations, about how uh, inventions are going to change the 20th century to make it uh, much different from the 19th, which was true. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was, you know, he was, he was, he was very sharp and really into technology and how it affected people and, and, and so forth. Um, and he made a couple of, you know, fairly major errors, but um, uh, of the people going on back then, uh, he was one of the best. And so as a, as a default, um, if he said something about it, um, like, why are people going to become, uh, uh, flawlessly nebiges, uh, you know, in the in the future, um, I I said okay, you know, well I I'll even just use his word for it, the Eloy, um, 
and uh, and because he had a, he had a point, um, and uh, you know I I found myself starting from that and then and then proceeding with um, the the differences between what we actually wind up seeing and 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 what he proposed, but um, he you know he got in the bullseye in the in the, in the first shot. And mm-hmm. so it was, it, it was worth listening, um, reading that story to begin with. That actually really defined science fiction to, to an extent for the 20th century. I mean, uh, you had uh, the cool machines and stuff like that from uh, Jules Verne. But uh, Wells was the first one to really capture what they call the sense of wonder, where um, mm-hmm. You know, you just you just get this feeling of, 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 of soaking in a much bigger universe than you thought. Um, and uh, so he was he was rightfully the uh, most read writer in the English language around you know, 1900. Wow. I, I didn't realize that I, I did. I mean, I really appreciated how much uh, as a lover of sci fi myself, how much of the book sort of comes from I mean, you did this very thorough analysis even of like all of the predictions of the sci-fi writers you know kind of prior to uh post-industrial revolution even post-atomic age um and what they thought we would have by you know the year 2020 um that, that was a very interesting piece and, and sort of revealing i think as you say up to you know what we what expectations we lived up to and exceeded and what which we missed entirely yeah, that list of 40 predictions were from people in the 50s and 60s. Um, I mm. didn't actually put any uh, wells in there because I was trying to capture the anticipations of people who had already seen nuclear power, who had already seen jets, who had already mm. seen all this sort of stuff. Um, and basically, uh, you know, if you draw a straight line through what they got from, say, um, the Wright brothers, um, the, uh, the line doesn't keep going straight. The line just takes a right turn and flat lines. Um, and, and that was, you know, that was something needing an explanation. Yeah. I'll say, <laughs> and, and hopefully some rectification, um, which yes. is, I feel like part of the mission that we're on here. If I, I try not to come into, uh, you know, too many podcasts with an agenda, but I have one here, um, which <laughs> is, you know, I, I, <laughs> I hope we can, uh, I hope we can take some small steps, um, you know, between us and everybody listening to, to hopefully get back on, you know, the, the Henry Adams curve. Um, I, I, most of people, the people listening probably are familiar with Moore's law. And, you know, the sort of technology that comes to the forefront there, um, but showing us Henry Adams curve and hopefully getting us back on the Moore's law for energy um, of the Henry Adams curve. Could you, could you take us through sort of the, the history of that and um, you know, where, where we fell off of it and how we might get back on? Yeah, well, I, uh, I tacked that name onto it because uh, I was, you know, it, it's a it's a delightful book to read. Uh, Henry Adams, who's the, the grandson of John Adams, the pre- second president, and, and 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 his father was another, was John Quincy. Um, so he was, you know, he was right in there, and and he was mm-hmm. sort of a man about town of the uh, the U.S. And, and Europe, which is basically you know where the action was in those days. And around 1910, he wrote his autobiography, and he looking back over his life, he says, "Wow." Um, you know, every every year we turn around and, and we get more energy to use. Uh, he called it force, but, you know, that's what he meant. Mm. Um, he talked about the amount of coal you could burn for, you know, how much money and uh, how many horsepower there were in a, a steamship, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And, and it was just uh, fabulously more than had been there when he was born or, you know, a century before, whatever. And so, uh, and he was the first one who really seemed to capture the notion that this is a glorious curve that we're on. Um, and so I named it after, him. um, mm-hmm. but, uh, but there he was. And, and, and other people have, have seen this. Uh, and in fact, up until the seventies, uh, the Henry Adams curve, uh, was the law basically that that's how things worked. We used more and more energy. Our life got better and better. Um, we went from having the Wright brothers model B airplane where, 
you know, you, two guys sit on this this contraption that looks like an oversized box kite, um, and and does 15 miles an hour in the air to um, uh, 727s. Okay, and that's 50 just 50 years is is that much of a jump? And when you get on an airplane today, 60 years after that, um, you get something that looks almost exactly like that 727. It's a little bigger. It goes a little slower um, and it's cheaper per passenger. But that, you know, that's the progress in the, in the past 60 years. How, how do you how do you separate sort of the because um, I think that's that is incredibly true for the commercial flights. But we do have some insane innovations in flight in maybe only in the military. Um, but maybe why aren't some of those more distributed or how do you separate sort of the, um, the innovations that get widely used versus those that, that don't? I think, again, what's happened is, is something of a re regression to the mean. If you look back at history, mm -hmm. almost always the major technological developments were in weaponry. Um, Mm. And so the the military is gonna have you know whatever the the, the best thing out there is, um, and I mean the fact is that uh, I was talking to the London futurists a, a week or two ago, and um, I was I was pointing out that if we had wanted to, um, I mean you look at the technology of the of the SpaceX uh, rockets right now. One of those would get me to London in the same amount of time it took to set up for the Zoom call. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, the, the, it's, the point basically is that it's not a case of technology being incapable or physics not allowing for the sort of things we're thinking of. The case actually is we just didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And that's... Um, uh, so, you know, if you want to get to, to London in 20 minutes, um, it's not only physically possible, it's technologically possible. I mean, just, you know, imagine a SpaceX Falcon with, with, with an, uh, a Mercury capsule on top, right? Yeah. Um, and boom, there you are. But uh, but we didn't. So, yeah. um, and, and nobody is doing that. I mean, it's not, not just not the average person. It's not the military. And they're talking about it. They're, they're, Actually, of course, they they all have uh, different desiderata for their machines than than we do. I mean, the military is never going to invent the family car, right. uh, but uh, they they do enough things that you can look at what they do and say, okay, this is at least a guide to what's technologically possible. Mm -hmm. So, but when I went back and, and looked at things like that in the in the book, um, for example, the the uh, the speed and capacities of, of passenger airliners. Um, there's some sense in which you really need to compare apples to apples. And so I was comparing airliners to airliners, <laughs> you know, and, and it went, it went up to uh, basically the sixties where the, where the speeds uh, hit uh, the optimal range. That's basically just transonic, um, just a, a few percent below the speed of sound. Um, and as you go through the speed of sound, it becomes really tough. And then once you get over it, um, you get nice, smooth flying again, except that you're using three times as much energy per mile. Mm. And it was the energy um, turns out to have been uh, the key to the whole business. I mean, all of yeah. the, all of the technologies that uh, that we didn't get. Um, you, I, you remember from the book, I, I, I plotted them out across a, a big graph. And mm -hmm. I, I expected when I made up that graph, I, I wrote the predictions down. And so there's 40 dots on the page. And the um, uh, I expected to have a, a sort of a cluster, a, uh, a two-dimensional bell curve cluster of, of stuff. And I expect it to be slightly tilted so you could see that, that uh, the more energy something used, the less likely it was to have been achieved. But I was flabbergasted when I actually plotted that out. I just fed, you know, the numbers I had assigned to the uh, to the predictions into a program, plotted them out, and boom, you got the bottom left half of the uh, graph was all populated with dots, 
and the top left half was completely empty as if somebody had chopped the top right half off with a machete. <laughs> and, and that represented basically every innovation that was had high energy intensity that we just didn't manage to achieve any of them because we were lacking in an increase. We, we fell off that Henry Adams curve, which is the energy utilization of the, yes. of the civilization, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That was, and, and it was, I, I just have to keep going back to that because it was such a, a startling uh, thing that, mm-hmm. that I, I hadn't even expected. I expected something like it, but not anywhere near that stark. Um, so if you want to know the, the difference between, um, you know, now and, and the, what the Jetsons expected, um, yeah. the, the, um, that's it. I mean, the, the big, big thing is, is energy. Now, of course, once you do that, you have to look and say, and, you know, why is energy falling off? What's, what happened? What contributed to that? And then we get back to the, the Eloy and the, all the other, um, social and economic things that, that, uh. I was talking about. Yeah. I, and we'll, we'll come back to the social piece, um, sort of a, a little later. I think it, it is very interesting to note as you do, like that the only areas we have made progress are those in software and sort of, uh, computation, which are not very energy intensive. Like the lack of cheap energy doesn't constrain growth in those. Um, but, but let's talk about what we have to do in order to sort of regain our, our energy growth rate, like to get back on the Henry Adams curve. And I think by way of definition, that's energy consumed by the species, right? It's, it's not availability, but it is like how many Watts all of humanity uses collectively. Right. Yeah. Well, the way I drew it, it was per capita, but it, it amounts to the same thing. Okay. Um, there's a, there's a a 2% growth curve in energy per capita. And there's another, um, 2% in, uh, people. And then there's uh, mm-hmm. another two percent, roughly, um, in uh, energy efficiency. So uh, the effective amount of energy that the human race uses is going well was going up mm-hmm. at six percent, and now uh, the per capita has has just really tightly flatlined, and mm-hmm. is, is going slightly down in places like America, although it's going up in China. Um, but I mean, that, that component of the curve is what the, what the typical person sees. And that's a, and that's a hard flat line. And, and uh, you and others have, have pointed out like that energy usage is probably a much better measure of quality of life than, you know, dollars consumed or available or earned, right? Like more energy generally equals a better and safer and more comfortable life. All other things being equal. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, there's this, this great line from uh, Bill Gates, who is, you know, probably the uh, uh, foremost philanthro, philanthro, uh, good deed doer of the uh, <laughs> world right now. Um, and uh, and what he says is, quote, uh, if there was one thing that you could reduce the price of to decrease poverty, it would be energy. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you look at that and you think, well, uh, if there was one thing you could increase the price of uh, to increase poverty, it would be energy um, by, by the exact same token. I mean, it just, mm-hmm. it's just looking at the same thing from the other side. And yet, uh, since the 60s and the, the, you know, the, the zeitgeist has been a war on energy. Um, and, you know, there's, there's been all sorts of excuses uh, for for the reasons, but you know when when push comes to shove, uh, the people who are who are you know out in the out in the front of this are basically saying, uh, you know, energy is horrible. We can't do it. Uh, you know, people people need to ride bicycles instead of having cars, no matter how clean the cars are, um, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum. Yeah, that that was maybe the most shocking thing to me is is sort of the the revelation that green activists. Are act or conservationists are actually anti energy. They're not pro clean energy. They're not. They're just anti energy because they're anti impact. And I had never considered that before. Um, and I found that quite disturbing actually, yeah. uh, because that that uh, mm-hmm. functionally means they are pro poverty. Like absolutely. 
Yeah. So, um, and, and there's a few contributors to, you know, we talked about, um, there's definitely a social zeitgeist, as you say, uh, around that. Um, and I'd like to pull that apart a little later. I'd like to get into regulation, but I want to, I want to sort of hear your path forward. You know, what, um, I think the, the common connotation is like more energy equals more pollution or equals more, uh, negative impact or, um, is it harmful in other ways? But I, I feel like, you know, there's a very clean, scientific, beautiful path forward. What do you, what do you see evolving? What is the happy path towards more energy for all? Well, I, I think, uh, as I, as I pointed out in the book, um, I'm nowhere near as, as uh, worried about things like climate change as, as many people seem to be. But mm -hmm. by the same token, um, we're not going to settle the solar system by burning fossil fuels in Earth's <laughs> atmosphere. It's just, you know, there's not enough fossil fuels and there's not enough atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so we need to, to be able to get energy uh, that you can use on the moon, that you can use on the moons of Jupiter, um, that you can use on, in deep space. Um, and you know, the bottom line there is, is, is essentially, um, it's either solar power, which is nuclear or it's nuclear. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sun puts out a lot of energy, but basically because it's very, very big, I mean, the, uh, the amount of energy produced per pound of sun is less than produced by, um, a, uh, a pile of garbage, you know, just just slowly hmm. rotting away. Um, so it, it's it's really big and it produces really a lot of uh, of energy, and we may as well use it. But um, if we once we get the scientific understanding of of how to uh, a recreate that or b do even better, um, the uh, the problem of energy just vanishes. I mean. If, for most of humanity's lifetime, the problem is going to be matter, not energy. Um, we, we're going to know how to produce energy um, so uh, spectacularly that that um, it's not going to it's not going to be anywhere near the the sort of uh, uh, problem that we think of it as being. Yeah, I think the way you put that in the book was too cheap to meter, which is, a, I don't know, yeah. maybe, maybe a little cheeky, but the, the uh, it's the way we think of bandwidth today, right? Like, Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I live in a, you know, a far uh, rural sort of place, which is great for a writer, and it's a beautiful spot. I look out over the Chesapeake Bay and, you know, mm. it's see the sunset. But the the thing is that, you know, up up until a couple of years ago, um, I had a DSL line that, that could, on a good day, get uh, three megabits, um, and uh, and I they just put in fiber, so I have 400 megabits, and all of a sudden I can, you know, I don't have to kick my wife off uh, when I want to <laughs> when I want to watch something. So you know, it, it's it's uh, embarrassment of riches almost. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, uh, excited about a vision of the future where energy is that same thing. It, it sort of boggles the mind when you start to think about what you would do with a functionally limitless source of energy and all the other things that that unlocks. And, and, and I think that's where you start to get, um, you know, your, your vision that you kind of put forward as, you know, th this next industrial revolution, um, which is th this combination of abundant energy, um, probably driven by nuclear AI and, and nanotech, um, and, and like the synergies for lack of a better word, I'm sure you have a, perhaps a more scientific word for it. Um, but I, I'd love if you show us sort of, um, how those three fit together and, and what they can accomplish in concert. Yeah. Well, synergy is a pretty good word. So, you know, um, I just called it the second atomic age and it was a pun. Uh, you know, the pun is uh, they used to talk about atomic energy and now we call it nuclear. But the fact is that the real atomic technology is going to be nanotech. Um, when you get to the point of, of designing and, and building machines, uh, an atom at a time, each atom in its place and, and so forth, um, the, the step up in capabilities uh, when you get to that point is just fantastical. And although that is not actually going to allow you to do 
uh, what we call nuclear processes directly. It's going to make our ability to provide the conditions so much better, easier, and, and, and easier to fix when something happens, i.e. Uh, isotopic separation, um, both for uh, producing uh, new nuclear fuels and for cleaning up uh, irradiated stuff. I mean, if there's a if if you wear a pair of gloves in a in a lab where um, there happens to be a sample of uh, uh, nuclear waste, um, and you throw the gloves out, they're considered nuclear waste um, mm-hmm. simply because they will have been slightly irradiated and and it's it's detectable. Um, but it's it's actually less r- radiation coming from that than a than a luminous style watch, um, and yet you know that that when people when people you know go on about you know oh the horrible nuclear waste problem, uh, what they're doing is they 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 talk about the really nasty stuff which is the, the actual spent fuel, um, where the uranium atoms have broken down into uh, these highly radioactive uh, daughter products. Um, but that's tiny, um, and the the actual huge amount of, of, of so-called waste is the stuff you know, the gloves that somebody's had on, um, and uh, which are only just detectably uh, more radioactive than uh, you know they were before, and, and probably less radioactive than a banana. Um, <laughs> so no, they are good. The bananas contain enough extra more pa- potassium than than ordinary stuff and potassium has a enough uh, potassium 40 uh, which is radioactive that a banana is is detectably more radioactive than than the background so yes yeah, yeah. that's that you know so if your nuclear waste is 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 less radioactive than bananas then you know you're 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 just making up scare stories um yeah so anyway it, that's uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think that's a really, um, I, I think the, all of the rebuttals to common concerns around nuclear, I think are, are really important and valuable in this book. And I think you do a pretty thorough job of like, you know, look, these things are not going to spontaneously combust. Having a nuclear power plant in your backyard is not dangerous. Um, the, the radio, our, our understanding of what's radioactive uh, and what's dangerous is like wildly out of <laughs> out of tune touch yes. with reality. The cost is massively lower. You can't weaponize the fuel, and there are very very few actually dangerous waste products, which I th- I think are like the main things that people get wrong. Um, but is did I miss any in there, or or did I understate the absurdity of any of our common concerns about nuclear that you'd like to <laughs> rectify? No, no, I, I I think you have a pretty good uh, handle in it there. Um, the uh, the other thing is that, uh, for example, you know, with as far as radioactivity is concerned, and and, and you pointed this out, um, people are are overly scared of of radioactivity, and and if you look at the the physiological harm that's done by people worrying about things, uh, in particular worrying about things that they can't help or fix. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually a lot worse for them than radiation. <laughs> um, so, so the people who are, who are you know, spreading the, the uh, scare stories are, are actually doing more damage to people than, than uh, radiation itself. But on the, yeah. the, and one, more, one more point here. The, um, now, this differs with people, and it differs with actual ty- types of radiation and exposures and so forth. It's a complicated subject. But there's a, a substantial... Uh, segment of this uh, phenomenon where radiation at reasonably low levels is actually good for you. It's called hormesis. Um, and the, the easy example of that is going out and getting some sun. Okay, It actually uh, enhances the amount of vitamin D your body uh, produces. If, if you live Oh, say in northern Sweden, um, and you don't go out all winter long, and you, and you get you don't use a sun lamp or take vitamin D or something like that. Um, that's as bad for you as being a chain smoker, as far as hmm. your, your health is concerned. So going out and getting radiation in the sun um, 
activates the body's repair and, and defense mechanisms, um, and you're better off with a certain amount, not not too much, but right. not too little either. And that's uh, that's that's what the the, the hormesis um, uh, phenomenon actually is. And again, I, I, I will caution that it is complex mm -hmm. and it's different for uh, different people, especially different people at different times of life um, and uh, different kinds of radiation. And, and so you have to know a lot about what's actually going on there. But uh, the, the notion that you could uh, blanket, uh, say, no radiation at all is actually harmful. Interesting. Okay. Um, could, could you give us a step, uh, or a, a snapshot of like where we are in nanotech right now? I know this is the area you've spent most of your career in. Um, and it was the newest to me and feels like the farthest out of, of sort of the three pillars of the next industrial revolution. Um, but where, where is nanotech right now? Is it mostly in the lab? Is it starting to get sort of commercialized? Like what are the first use cases that we'll, that we'll see? Um, maybe that sort of overview. Well, people are people are beginning to do the stuff. Um, I was about ten years ago. I was president of the Foresight Institute, which is the uh, thing that Drexler founded to to try and mm. help nanotech come along. And um, I said, look, you know, instead of just sitting around waiting, why don't we try the scheme that Feynman came up with around 1960? Um, start with a machine shop, you know, and 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 understand the architecture you need to build another machine shop smaller. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not easy because the new machine shop has to have higher uh, tolerances, you know, tighter tolerances on the machines and, and smoother surfaces. And, you know, it just has to be better um, than the machine that made it. And, and that is not obviously easy. Uh, in fact, it's, it's very hard, but that's what actually happened. Over the course of the Industrial Revolution, we started out with uh, blacksmiths and we got to, um, you know, hyper fine machinery with, uh, you know, sub micron tolerances. Um, uh, and every one of them was made by an earlier machine. Um, mm -hmm. So that ha that that happens and it can work. Um, and if you sit down and try to do it specifically, you ought to be able to do it faster than, you know, the Industrial Revolution. But even if you don't, the, that's what the Industrial Revolution has done and is doing and will continue to do. So um, the question is not whether we are going to get to nanotechnology, where we are designing things uh, atom by atom. It's how long it's going to take to get there and how fast the progress is going to be and how focused mm -hmm. it is. And, and if I had to sit down and, and talk about the whole business – um, I would say that progress has really um, been a continuation of the of the um, industrial revolution trend, rather than having been a, a focused um, moonshot or you know Manhattan project to to get nanotech. And that's a shame because if it had been the um, we would have a bunch of this stuff now. Um, and, you know, I might live forever, but in fact, chances are I won't. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, but that's just a personal thing. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, uh, but, you know, it, technology does advance and, and I'm alive because of it. So uh, in more than one, more than one case. So it, it, it you know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll continue to be lucky, but, uh, so, so we're somewhere between just what would have happened anyway, and mm -hmm. uh, taking advantage of the of the insights of of the great minds um, that came up with this. And, and in the book, I talk about Heinlein, Feynman, and, and and Drexler because they were the three that hit on the on the specific thing that we that we were talking about. But uh, it to to make a. a a, a, just a general sort of a description of the of the problem is that we do have a uh, an atomically precise technology right now. It's it's life. It's, it's how cells work, um, and all of the uh, mechanisms inside of a cell that are made of protein and RNA and and all that sort of stuff um, are in fact 
designed and uh, manufactured atom for atom. They have, you know, they have every, a place for every atom and every atom in its place. And that gives it properties that, uh, you know, big clunky machines just don't have. Mm -hmm. And so imagine uh, something like life only with the, the power densities and speeds of mechanical machines because uh, life uses a, uh, a fairly slow um, design process that is uh, best for evolvability. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if I were going to build a machine to do something, I wouldn't care whether it evolved. I wanted to do the one thing and I would design a, uh, a hard, high temperature, fast um, design that, that could not evolve because I don't want it to. And, and you're, you're looking at a completely different phase of uh, technology there. Yeah, that, that's probably the most mind-boggling thing is, is the stuff that unlocks when, when what you're describing, you know, that uh, sort of something that's as fast and smart and replicable as, as we want it to be really goes. Like that is where, you know, the sci-fi turns reality. Um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, what are some of the things that you see that might enter our practical lives when, when we sort of unlock that next... Um, nanotechnology well, I, one industrial the, one base the, as you say one of the things that that uh will will give you a kind of a uh, acute example of, mm -hmm. of the sort of uh technology's capability um is that nowadays nerds are famous for walking around with a pocket protector and a bunch of pens in it um and you know they pull the pen out and it's a, a ballpoint pen and they can write with it and then they put it back up and so forth um once you get to uh, full-fledged, uh, capable nanotechnology, the kind of thing you could build would be that when you when you pull that pen out, you throw it and it expands in the air and, and is a full-sized uh, humanoid robot. Um, it's, it's still not, no heavier than the pen was um, hmm. because, you know, it doesn't do anything uh, to gain uh, mass, but um, the the body's size, shape, and, and strength in particular um, would be essentially uh, equivalent to a, to a human being. Um, and, you know, and then it does its job and, and then you, you know, folds itself back up and you stick it in your pocket and walk off. Um, but the, I mean, that's, that's roughly the, the capability of nanotech um, reduced to a, a, a simple personal scale uh, thing. I mean, if you want to, if you want to take the opposite end, um, you take the little uh, conversation I had with Rob Freitas um, a couple of decades ago when we were trying to figure out uh, how quickly you could reproduce the entire capital stock of uh, of the United States, and we sat down and and you know diddled in our books and calculated and so forth and looked to look back up at each other and in right in unison said about a week, um, and okay. you know that. That means oh. replace every single machine and building and road and ship and, you know, tower and, and transmission line, everything out there. Everything that we have built could be rebuilt in a week if we had mature nanotech. That's You're how much my mind, Josh. <laughs> You're blowing my mind. So, so and to, to have that level of, of nanotech... Um, we we certainly need that abundant nuclear energy that we talked about. Um, what what else sort of um, what other breakthroughs do do we need to have? Um, you know, either either in the lab or, or outside um, in order to kind of inch us towards that that future. Well, the 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 three legs on my three legged stool uh, that I that I call the the second atomic age are. Um, the uh, the nanotech for the uh, physical manipulation, the uh, nuclear for the energy, um, which is made much easier and, and more likely to happen by uh, the nanotech, not only for the machines that you need to make it work, but for the machines that you need to do the science and understand what's going on and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so you so you have science to go 
in nuclear, and then you have um, the uh, we can't we pretty much understand everything you need to do in nanotech. Uh, we just haven't gotten to gotten around to doing it. We don't know everything you need to do in nuclear, um, mm -hmm. and uh, but we have you know we have science, we have the tools, and nanotech will give us much better tools. Uh, and so you know once we have a, a a decent nanotech technology, you ought to be able to start uh, improving your, your nuclear um, usage. I mean, and ultimately, I'm, I'm talking into the century or, or maybe even later, um, you'll get to a point where any, any energy that's available, according to the physics, um, can be captured and used. So, uh, and at that point, um, you, can, you can take ordinary uh, nitrogen, you know, the, the major component of the air that that's just an inert gas, um, uh, fuse the two nitrogen atoms in a uh, nitrogen molecule, um, get a silicon atom out and lots of energy. So, I mean, and so just plain empty air is your fuel. Um, so, I mean, that's, as I say, it's probably, a, that's probably a century off, but but all you have to do is just look at the, the chart of the nuclides, the sort of the, the nuclear version of the periodic table, and, you know, and just do the math. It, there's the energy. It's just sitting there. Um, so the third leg of, the, of our triad here is, um, is intelligence. And that is, um, you know, often called artificial intelligence today. Um, but it's... Uh, uh, it requires a, a better understanding of decision-making processes, um, a better use of feedback in the uh, situations where we actually need to do decision-making. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then ultimately the, the ability to program those into uh, a machine and, and, and have something that is, has got the sort of smarts and common sense of a, of a human being. Um, and we've made it enormous strides. In fact, of all the technologies that we have right now, uh, AI is the one that is most on the track that people back in the 60s thought it was going to be. Um, Isaac Asimov had a very good notion of, of just how far robots would be uh, nowadays, and, and he got it just about right. So, um, But to understand how much we need that, um, go back to we can replace the entire um, capital stock of the United States in a week. How long is it going to take you to get construction permits? <laughs> okay. And draw and draw blueprints and yeah 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 yeah. So, so I mean, and design it and and um, you know and then do it legally. It turns out that that is by far the the worst part of even with today's technology. <laughs> If you're trying to do anything that that um, you're not already uh, licensed to do, um, you know, well, the the really worst example is build a nuclear power plant. But yes, I'm, but I'm I'm talking about putting a wing on my house. You know, it, that's the mm -hmm. that is the 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 hardest part of the whole process. Yeah, the, the AI was a very interesting um, sort of component. So, so I, I was surprised to hear that we are actually, um, to your eyes, farther ahead in nanotech than we are in nuclear. I, I think just in the um, sort of in the ether, way more people talk about nuclear, and we've had nuclear for longer than we've had nanotech. Um, so I just kind of assumed that we were that nanotech was the furthest behind, and that um, nuclear was. But you know, if we're if we are the farthest behind on nuclear. Um, but we need the nan we need nuclear to power the nanotech and the feedback loop between those two um, that gets us into those sort of small self powered um, devices. Uh, that that is very interesting. Yeah. Well, right now the the best we can do as far as nuclear is concerned is is uh, have a, a giant critical mass you know big reactor and mm -hmm. cores and coolings and uh, containment uh, domes and all that sort of stuff and you really can't make it smaller than that. Um, uh, if you're if you're a lab and uh, you're just there's there have been um, you know sort of uh, nuclear that would fit in a phone booth 
but um, mm-hmm. there's there's no basic technology base for doing that. And the best way to do it is nowhere near understood. Um, the difference is, and, and you got this exactly right, uh, the difference is that since the 60s, um, chemistry didn't stop. And in particular, <laughs> biology didn't stop. People, people have been learning uh, by leaps and bounds, uh, cool molecular biology stuff, you know, getting all the way up to CRISPR and, and the ability to mm-hmm. uh, say, OK, I want my DNA to say this. Let's just make it that way. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's almost like a printer for uh, for DNA. Um, and all you have to do now is know what to print. Um, well, the uh, on the other hand, uh, nuclear physics uh, and nuclear engineering didn't just flatline in the in the 70s. Um, they cratered and, and you know, went down to, to virtually nothing. Um, and uh, so uh, you were right. The nuclear has actually been uh, by far the slowest of the technologies to develop. Yeah, which which is uh, upsetting, um, and, and we'll we'll come back to a little bit of that uh, in the, the regulation and the incentives um, in a moment here. But I want I want to tie up the sort of the three pillars that you took us through. Um, so, I, of all the people, I gifted this book as I said uh, before we started recording to uh, ten people. I still have a stack of them in my closet. I want to give them away to everybody. I want everyone on the planet to read this book, um, and in particular, the more sort of prone they are to helping usher in this future, the more I want them to read it. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to need a bigger camera because my head's swelling here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, by far the most common question. Um, and I, I talked with a few friends, um, sort of in the lead up to this interview and just said, you know, I'm finally interviewing the author. I'm very excited about it. What do you want to know? And probably half of all their questions were basically like resource allocation questions. Um, about, you know, all kind of in this general vein of like, how do we make this happen? Um, so I'll, I'll give you a few of these and, and let's see um, sort of what we can all do to, to help um, bring this forward. But if, if you were in charge of allocating $10 billion in philanthropy with no restrictions, wh- where would you put it? Um, the benevolent worker placement problem for, uh, for helping to mm. move these technologies forward. I would have the biggest yacht you ever saw in your life. <laughs> um, seriously, it, it's it's a hard problem, and um, I'm unlikely to come close to getting it right with a you know with, with a tall self answer. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, basically, I would I would say first just uh, um, figure some way of of getting some of it into nuclear. I mean, this Bill Gates did that, right? Um, mm-hmm. And he he he's Having known the problem with the, with his uh, energy and poverty and so forth, um, he tries to to put money into into nuclear, and um, the uh, the NRC stepped on him and said, you know, you can't do that here. Um, so he went to China and started, uh, you know, because they're uh, much more into uh, high power technology than we are nowadays, um, and they they were saying, sure. Um, and then uh, the uh, the administration um, stepped on him again, saying, "No, you can't give this stuff to the Chinese." <laughs> um, so anyway, the I I don't know. Maybe you would just have to hire a lot of lawyers first. Um, <laughs> but you know that that's uh, that, that unfortunately seems to be uh, where we're sitting. Um, so as as far as I mean, I I'm I'm a technologist, so mm-hmm. I I tend to. Um, look at the problems and say, okay, it's, it's, you know, how do you invent this and how do you build that and, and so forth. And, and then, then I, I kind of look up and notice that there, there are people out there that, that, you know, make their living keeping you from doing it. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, the, it was sort of my reaction to that, 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 that caused the, the, the book to come the way it did. But uh, uh, unfortunately there's been this, this notion that we don't have flying cars because, uh, you can't make flying cars. It, you know, it, it, it would be impossible for the average person to to own one or to fly one or or all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. Um, and so one of the one of the main things of the book was I I just wanted to look at that and say, is that really true? And 
of course it's not. Um, the, the, the real reason we don't have flying cars uh, has a lot to do with uh, economics. Um, first off, nobody's going to buy a flying car if it's not worth more than a ground car because they already have a ground car. They're used to them. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you want to you want a flying car that can do uh, more things uh, better than your ground car. And so you have to have, you know, some kind of extra push there. Well, it turns out that one of the one of the big extra pushes about uh, flying machines is that they get you there faster. Um, yeah. So I said, so I, I, I went and looked up the, the travel literature, um, travel theory, and, um, and, and basically worked out um, how much value there was uh, to being able to get places fast. And so when you build a flying car, I can tell you, at least as at, at a first cut. I mean, this is this is no, by no means a PhD in economics, but at, as a first cut, I can tell you um, that if you have a uh, a thing that can take off from your driveway and um, uh, go at roughly airliner speeds to where you're going, and then land in the in the other driveway, um, it would be worth seven times as much as a as a ground car. Um, and, and yeah, that might be 10, it might be five, but you know, that, that's the number I got. And so the first thing is here you have, uh, at least the other side of the equation, everybody who I've seen who've, who's looked at flying cars say, how much does it cost to build this? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what can you get away with? Blah, 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 blah. But the other half of the equation is how much is it worth? Um, because if, if, if it costs less to build it, than it's worth, people will build it. And if it costs more then they won't, um, and, and there's other reasons for having a flying car. I mean, if, if, if I had one that was, that was only, uh, you know, three times as valuable as my car or even as valuable as my car, since we, I, I'm a, uh, an early adopting, uh, techno freak, um, I would get one, um, yeah. <laughs> if I could, if I could possibly manage to afford it, but, um, but the and you did, and you did get a plane and a pilot's license as you researched yeah. this book. So in a way, you have, right. yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a matter of fact. Not only that, we, uh, my wife and I got a, a gyro, and and uh, oh, cool. uh, both learned to, both learned to fly that. Um, so you know, we, we're you know we we will do that. I mean, somebody <laughs> will, and it, it and and the kinks will get worked out one way or the other, and so forth. But um, the uh, the bottom line is. That to build a flying car that does that, I mean, you have to um, you have to go for the not only the high speed but the driveway. Okay, mm-hmm. and to build a car like that, um, it has to have uh, a megawatt engine, a thousand horsepower, um, and uh, and that runs instantly afoul of the collapse of the Henry Adams curve. Mm-hmm. And that's why we don't have flying cars, because the 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 collapse of of energy per capita leaves us without being able to build the high value flying cars. And that back to that energy is is upstream of of absolutely everything. Yeah. So as we think about how we how we invest, you know, a lot, a lot of the people uh, listening, I think, are investors, and I, I love investing in early stage technology. I think is, is a contribution to bringing more of it about. Um, we, we've seen a lot of money go into, uh, not even a lot of money really go into transportation, but I, I rarely hear about nanotech startups getting funded. Uh, and, and like, how do you, how do you see that the process of these technologies get commercialized and get investment? Like, where do you expect this to sort of enter the world economy and, and expand from there? Well, I can give you a good example. Um, okay. that's when it's when I predicted 10 years ago in an earlier book, um, which was about artificial intelligence. And um, I said, you know, all these people saying, this is what we need to do to produce AI. This is this other thing, you know, we're going to build a, an AI that's going to be so smart, it's going to write AI all by itself. Um, even though, you know, you figure, well, how's it going to write itself if it doesn't exist yet? But anyway, <laughs> there, all, there's all this sort of stuff that people had others, all sorts of schemes for, for producing AI. And I said, no, that's not going to be the way it works. What's going to happen is people are going to keep plugging away and 
at some point, uh, the, the latest developments are going to start being promising and people are going to do them and they're going to start using them and they're going to work. And once they start noticeably working and doing stuff that, that people didn't quite realize or didn't expect that um, they were going to be capable of, um, the, the, like the, the, the watershed in Google Translate, you know, overnight, all of a sudden, they, they, they swapped in the, the neural net version and, and, and boom, it started working so much better um, right overnight. And, and once something like that happened, and, and it happened in more than one place, um, then all of a sudden the, the, the VCs are going to come around and say, oh, it looks like this, something is going on here, and they're going to start putting money into it. And once the money starts going into it, then you're going to have the resources to take all the new developments and, and push them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's going to be a self-accelerating process. And that's exactly what happened, and, and that's the AI boom we have today. Um, mm -hmm. So the for for nanotech, I think that's basically all you need. I, I think that that people keep plugging along and you know a few more quote good ideas show up and uh, that and some of them start working and, and doing things that used to be expensive cheaply or better or, or, or whatever. And and you're gonna have the same thought. It's probably gonna happen in this decade. Mm -hmm. Um in in I mean I that's been predicted before, but um well, it's complicated. But anyway, I think that <laughs> there's a probably a, a decent chance that it will happen in this decade and, sure. and if not in the next. So but it's going to look like the AI boom. It's, it, people are just going to say, oh, look, this is this is working better than we thought. Um, let's put some money into it and that will accelerate. And, and Bob's your uncle. Um, All right. So uh, the that leaves you with with nuclear and that's. A completely different animal. Um, the, you got a um, you got a whole bunch of roadblocks in your way, and you have uh, you know sixty years of, of neglected science. Um, so it's going to be a harder sell and, and uh, a harder catch up to do. Um, but at least there's a possibility that people, because they're so worried about fossil fuels are going to begin to start looking at this again and, and at least um, start filling in the, the science gap. Um, and uh, uh, you can never tell what regulation is going to do, and, and I, I wouldn't even uh, take a guess. But um, it is it is possible for, for something like that to happen, even with the, with the roadblocks. Yeah, it's it's very interesting how different those are those are going to evolve. You know, as you say, the the difference in what you expect the next step to look like in nanotech versus versus nuclear. Um, it, it seems so that pre VC pre the boom you're sort of talking about, where something really starts to work and commercial money comes in, um, that it's mostly. Is it true that most of this is sort of funded by the government? Most of this early nanotech research comes from from limited grants and stuff from central funding sources. Um, well, that's actually part of the problem was that uh, uh, nanotech research was going on in the funded uh, university military uh, complex. I was in that myself, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so what happens is, you know, you have to go and find some guy in, in DARPA or NSF or, you know, who who likes what it is you're doing. Um, and, the, you know, the further you get from the military and the closer you get to the um, the NSF in the in the um, uh, science world, uh, the more politics is 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 involved. I mean, the, mm -hmm. So DARPA can fund something just because one guy likes it. But, you know, you got all sorts of peer review and, and, and plenty of chances for people to play politics and, and trip you up um, mm -hmm. the closer you get over to the, to the science side of things. So uh, what happened was that um, when they, they did the National Nanotechnology Initiative, they didn't actually put any extra money in it for nanotechnology. What they did was they just 
stole money from a whole bunch of other budgets of places that were doing things like ma macromolecular chemistry and surface science and um, mm. and that kind of stuff. Um, all of which could be thought of as being relevant to nanotechnology and vice versa. And I said, okay, now this money is in the National Nanotech Initiative. And all the people who had been getting this money said, oh, no, you don't. Um, and so there was a huge political backlash, and it um, kind of clobbered the research in nanotech that wasn't the sort of stuff that people had already been doing. Um, and I, I was there and I watched that happen. Um, and I don't think that's going to happen again, because I think that the process I'm describing, the one in the, the one with uh, uh, the model, the model in the AI world mm -hmm. is going to be private money. And people are going to be doing it because they see it working as opposed mm -hmm. to um, people trying to stop it because they were already doing something differently and didn't want that money going to nano. Um, but the, uh, so, so yeah, the process is probably going to be like um, the, the AI one. Now the, the, the heyday of um, government funding for artificial intelligence was the fifties, uh, sorry, the sixties and seventies. Um, and uh, I was there too, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it, 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 it went on and it went on and it went on. And, and then uh, you know, sometime in the 80s, uh, they get tired of it because, you know, people have been promising them all this wonderful stuff and it didn't happen. And so the, the, uh, the people in the field call it the AI winter um, mm. after, after nuclear winter. But uh, it was, you know, basically this, this big funding crash. Um, and, and, then, and then AI kind of uh, muddled along um, and uh, the reason that AI got better and better over all of those years was simply and purely because computers got faster and faster and had more memory. And there was things that uh, it simply isn't possible to do with a small program on a small computer, no matter how ingenious mm. it is. You have to use brute force. Yeah. Um, so in, in some of this, these funding methods, you know, if, if nanotech's in this sort of dark period between centralized funding sort of failed for all the reasons that you just described, um, and we're not quite at, you know, this influx of, of VC money, uh, what are the alternatives to, to either government money or private money? How do we help sort of bridge the gap between, you know, to, to get these technologies into clearly the, the space of commercialization and uh, that, re that feedback loop of, you know, invention and product and um, return on capital. Oh my goodness. Um, you know, if, if you're, if you I'm say, I'm just putting all the, all the world's problems yeah, on your right. back in this interview, that's uh, your, your <laughs> only hope, Josh. <laughs> well, I mean, basically, uh, you know, if, if you say it's not government and it's not private, you're looking for angels and aliens here. Um, but the, <laughs> but the, the uh, but I think, I think there's enough, uh, private money, um, that, is feasible to, to do, especially nanotech. Um, mm. And as we know, there, there's, uh, there's private money uh, to do nuclear. I know we, we, have, yeah. we have Gates, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the fusion reactor um, that coming out of MIT, which is much more likely to succeed than the gigantic uh, European uh, uh, ITER project. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you know what that is, it is this, this, this really monstrous thing um, that they're, they're trying to build a, a, a tokamak with uh, uh, 10, 15 year old magnet technology um, because it's a government project. And, you know, that's when the design was frozen. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, chances are by, uh, uh, you know, 2035, they're going to reach break even. Um, in, in the actual reactor itself. But by that time, there's going to be commercial fusion from the, you know, 20 odd different fusion startups out there right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there is private money going into <laughs> nuclear. Um, it's mostly fusion um, because everybody thinks that fission is, is old fashioned and, and so forth. There are still some interesting other uh, pathways into 
nuclear. I mean, there's uh, there's this NASA thing where um, it's a uh, a kind of a mush of cold fusion and a um, particle accelerator where where they 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 take um, uh, metals and load them with deuterium the way you would in a in a cold fusion experiment, and then they shove it in front of a particle accelerator and boom, fusion happens. Um, and you know, and, and it's obvious it's happening, and they can turn it on and yeah. off at will, and all this sort of stuff. And that's going on at NASA right now. Um, and I believe the Navy is into it, and uh, and some other people. Um, but there, there's a lots of projects like that, and mm. not all of them will work. Maybe not even most of them will work, but but some of them will. Um, and uh, so I, I think I think the new uh, uh, magnetic confinement. Uh, fusion uh, thing that's gotten well over a billion in private funding at, at it's an MIT spinoff um, is is likely to uh, uh, at least produce break even energy. I, I don't know. I have no clue actually whether it's going to be commercially feasible or not. But um, I you know if it if it actually works and you know somebody looks at it and says well we can do this this way and and it will be half as expensive. Um, you know, you're, you're you're still talking 2030s, but um, mm -hmm. um, you know we'll, we'll have fusion power, um, and and there's there's like I say there's there's at least 20 different companies like that, some better and some less better funded, but but they're all out there swinging. That's extremely encouraging. Um, it, it, it's, it sounds like more progress than not, um, at, at least in some small sort of distributed experiments. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the regulatory uh, veil isn't stifling absolutely everything, you know, before it at least gets a chance to walk. Yeah. Well, that, that it, there's a, there's a yeah. number of questions around that actually too. So, you know, um, maybe look at what were some of the most damaging regulatory either laws or, or um, agencies that, that you saw towards, towards some of these innovations, you know, if you, if you could remove one, uh, one or two, or, or how do you think we can best, um, sort of a advocate and, and move policymakers towards something slightly more sane uh, when it comes to mm -hmm. probably energy and nuclear in particular? Um, well, I think the NRC is probably the worst. Uh, if you pick a single particular agency, um, sure. the FAA is a huge uh, stumbling block to private uh, aviation. Um, mm -hmm. But if you want to talk about private, avi private aviation, the um, the trial lawyers, the um, uh, ambulance chasers, for lack of a better term, um, are what actually destroyed the the light aircraft industry, and that was uh -huh. back around back around uh, 1980. Um, the, there was a, a shift in the interpretation of the law that allowed, um, say, you're a pilot, you know, and and uh, uh, you get drunk and you have this 40 year old airplane and you fly into somebody's house and you die and the house burns down. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody is a victim because, you know, the people in the house and all your relatives and, and so forth. Who do they sue? They sue the manufacturer of the airplane, right? Even though it was built 40 years ago and you should never have been flying it in the first place. Um, Let alone drunk. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. but, but that's the way it works. And and that completely destroyed the the private aircraft industry, and uh, so basically there, there's two kinds of airplanes out there, um, small private ones, and they are um, forty years old and homemade. Interesting, yeah, and and the commercial, I mean, the regulatory burden on the commercial airline industry enormous and expensive as well, um, and I think. I think I was listening to one of your other interviews. You said there was there was a nuclear um, project that had basically raised a billion dollars and spent all of it on lawyers before oh, before making scale. really yeah, any right. tangible projects progress in in the real world uh, towards energy generation. Yeah, what, what was I the was, name of that? New scale. I, I was yeah. flabbergasted with how much money it cost them just to file um, uh, a an application yeah. to, to to build and run a uh, um, experimental reactor in their new design. Wow. Um, so yeah, ab abolish the NRC is, is a, <laughs> a, re a reasonable step. Maybe we, right. we can maybe take, and, and there's a, there's a probably a perception war as well, knowing that, you know, the politicians are probably a reflection of the, the whoever's winning the meme war, um, 
of any given technology at a current time. They're just reflecting our own policies back to us. I, I hope there's, uh, you know, yeah, we're, well, uh, there's a lot of truth to that. It really is. Yeah. I, I hope that, the, you know, this podcast is one small spear in a wall of, uh, you know, the anti-propaganda and pro pro technology right. propaganda. Yep. Um, pull, pull a finger out of the dike and hope the trickle, <laughs> Uh, gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> yes. Um, if, if the regulatory, you know, when, as I was reading the book and thinking about the, the regulatory challenges that you talked about in there and, um, you know, how much that's hampered the growth of, of nuclear and energy in general. Um, one of the good things about that is, you know, there's a lot of governments on earth and I have to imagine that somewhere there's someone who is hungry or, you know, governments compete for, for tax dollars and positions. And I imagine there's, um, some governments that have to be, or become pretty quickly friendly towards experimenting with, with nuclear, especially with some of the political challenges that come with relying on fossil fuels, um, that we see now, but are there in your experience, governments or places that are aggressively experimenting with this, that, you know, dollars or talent will flow over time and we'll see something, some country sort of take the forefront in this? Um, well, I, I certainly hope so. And there, uh, the problem with that is basically that um, the, uh, what I call the Machiavelli effect works between countries as well as uh, uh, individuals uh, and, and bureaucracies and, the the bottom line is that you know if you're a, a little country um suppose you were say estonia where, where actually they, they do a lot of cool experimentation and and, and uh progressive stuff the uh and they suddenly started uh a uh fast advancing nuclear program um the uh they would quickly be accused of trying to build nuclear weapons and, uh, and get stepped on. Um, uh, and yeah, so just think of all the other little countries, you know, of that are trying to do that. Um, yeah. so, uh, it's, it's not just as simple as, as somebody being out from under and, and, and getting to, to, to try this stuff. Um, there's still a, uh, a fair thicket of bram brambles that, that you have to navigate through, um, to, to get there. Um, but I think that the closer we get to something that, that, that really starts working, I mean, right now, things like the, the fusion reactors I was talking about, which are the, the sort of things you can build because it, mm -hmm. it's licensed more like a, um, a scientific instrument than a, a, a nuclear power plant. And so that's where a lot of the money is going in, 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 what you would call nuclear experimentation nowadays. As soon as people begin to find ways of, of, of doing things that, that are not billion dollar projects, but million dollar projects, mm. then you'll, you'll start to see a thousand uh, flowers bloom and, and, um, and, and more progress, sort of just like AI. Right now, um, the, uh, the kind of computer that you can get and put on your desk is uh, um, literally hundreds of times more powerful than, you know, Cray One, which cost millions of dollars back in the day. And back in the in the early heyday of uh, AI, uh, you know, the, the uh, PDP tens at, at MIT that they were doing uh, all the classic AI uh, list programming on um, had uh, uh, a million words of memory. Uh, ran one million instructions per second and cost a million dollars, um, and that's I mean you can, you can get a, uh, a a single board computer you put in your pocket, uh, uh, much less your your cell phone uh, has has way more than that and and a, something that a uh, a hobbyist could can afford and and do real serious AI experimentation, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know is 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 uh, Still, you know, like the computer you always wanted is five thousand um, yeah. dollars. That, that's a that's the saying from way back when. Um, you know, well, yeah, well, you know, so uh, yeah, and 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 almost anybody can can do that if 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 that's what's important to them. It, that is an interesting thing about studying sort of the history of you know science and.
technology and discoveries, how many of them come from these decentralized experimental roots and how few really come from the institutions that you might expect are making these breakthroughs. Um, it, I think in part due to the, just the incentives of who's working on what and who has reason to, you know, like there's, there's all these, you know, energy companies and oil companies running sort of pr propaganda campaigns about what they support in terms of clean energy and renewables and things like that. Do, do you, do you buy that? Um, or do you I essentially think, think that? I think that there there's, there's examples in the, in the business world without even getting into the science and technology, which is, you know, um, all the, all the new growth ideas and, and new jobs and all that sort of stuff come from the startups. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, then, you know, you, you, you found a startup and, and it grows and grows and then you sell it and, um, you know, you either, you know, depending on just how, how happy you are, you, you found another one and do it again, or you buy a yacht. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, so, but, but that's, you know, that it, all, all your, your, uh, listeners who are, um, in the business world, you know, know that. Um, mm -hmm. so, and, and all I have to say really is the, the scientific, uh, engineering and technological world is just the same way. Yeah, the, the, the I think this was from one of your other interviews. Um, it, talking about the something that I hadn't been aware of being outside that world of of academia and um, science is, you know, the the biases and incentives within that are just as varied, sundry, and dangerous as the ones in in the business world or the political world. Um, you know, ex outside of science, we have this view that you know there is a body of science and everyone's just trying to sort of find the truth. Um, and you you broke down. Uh, sort of all of the various incentives that various scientists might have that might influence their their work or their resources uh, and how they allocate their things, let alone sort of the outcomes that they arrive at and the views that they support. Yeah, well, and, well having had, you know, lots of personal experience in uh, the scientific world and uh, some experience, uh, most of it uh, from my wife who was in the, the business world, um, mm. I would have said that um, the business world is, is, is slightly nicer than the than the than the academic or science world. It, that it's a little more cutthroat on the academic side because it's a little more zero sum. Absolutely, that that would be mm. exactly if I were going to draw a reason for it. That's that's what I would say. So, is and what are the what are the incentives? I mean, are, are scientists acting to um, you know, su support their industries? Are they supporting their, their core theses? Are they just kind of trying to protect their career in many cases? Like, and, and how do you separate the, who is a, who is a trustworthy um, sort of upholder of the true definition of science versus, you know, someone who's credentialed, but really supporting their own agenda? Uh, basically all of the above. I mean, if you want to be able to pick out who's the good guys and the bad guys, you, you know, I, I can't tell you go watch game of Thrones. I mean, it's, uh... <laughs> I'm not sure there was any redeeming characters in that one. I'm hoping there are in, in this cast. Oh boy. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I gotta I, say, they, I would gotta say basically they, they, they film on some really spectacularly beautiful locations. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say so much for the people. <laughs> how do you, who do you, who do you look to in this world? Like, how do you, um, you know, I, I note that your bio starts with you know, an independent scientist and author. Um, you know, who, mm. I think that's a very deliberate choice to mm. identify yourself that way. And, and, you know, who else would you, um, recommend that we look to that might not have these, this conflict? Um, um well, if I, if I knew a really good big one, I would be, you know, doing it. But um, uh, at the moment, uh, like I, I worked at, at Rutgers um, uh, mostly for federal money um, uh, for uh, most of the, you know, part of the uh, 20th century that, that, that I was in there doing that kind of thing. Um, and it, interestingly enough, just to, to hit another point that we've talked about before, um, I started out in artificial intelligence in a big way and, and uh, did a lot of studying of that and so forth and ultimately came to the conclusion that what we really needed uh, was not more ingenious algorithms, but uh, um, faster machines. And so I, I shifted from uh, AI to 
uh, architecture, uh, designing you know massively parallel machines and and that kind of thing, um, and you know, uh, purely by luck, I guess, um, uh, you know, shifted from a sinking ship to a to a uh, a moving one, and uh, and and finished out my career there um, doing that kind of thing, and then uh, uh, basically. You know, got into nanotech and thought it was so cool that I, I just hop, skipped, and jumped. And so I was president of Foresight Institute for a while and uh, was a, uh, a, a startup scientist at, at uh, Nanorex, which was trying to build a uh, molecular CAD system, um, hmm. which, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a good thing and, and somebody will have to go back and do that again. But uh we actually had a, a very, really nice little piece of software that, that you could use to design molecular machines and um, that kind of thing. So uh, it was, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, basically once uh, once I got out of that, I, I uh, just started writing books. Um, since I um, uh, my my business world wife was. Uh, uh, easily capable of supporting us for, for 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 much more than you know we I would have ever gotten in the academic world. So, um, uh, you know that that's my career. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm and I'm very glad that you have shifted to book writing. I, I hope um, you know that this has a, a wide ranging and massive impact. I, I heard you describe you know you, you set out to as many authors, including myself do set out on what you think is a two year project and then find out it's, it's much more than that. <laughs> right. Oh yes. Uh, yes. And, and you've sort of, um, I, I think I'm paraphrasing, but accidentally written your technical memoirs, um, yep. in this, yep. which, mm -hmm. which is something I, I really appreciate. I think, um, you know, you bring a lot of personality to it. It's very wide ranging. It covers a lot of ground. It's, um, fascinating, like scientifically and economically, and gives me, you know, great dreams for the future. Um, and you're, and you're swelling my head again. Um, uh, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it a few more times if you give me the chance. Uh, and I, you yeah. know, as a science fiction fan, I appreciate that you, uh, you know, one, you reference a lot of science fiction, you're clearly motivated by a lot of it. And you have, I think you almost end the book with a call to science fiction to sort of get back to what it does best, which is let us dream, you know, dream big dreams for the future and um get Absolutely. greedy for a Absolutely. for an incredible you know mm -hmm. next sort of huge yeah. huge thing uh well, that's, it's what, what we could do and and uh the the current zeitgeist of of just lying around and waiting for the world to end and going oh um <laughs> it, it's just you know it, i i can't see that i you know we had we had a glorious future before us in the 60s and we still do all we have to do is actually realize it and, and, and go do it. What, what do you see as, as some of the most inspiring stuff that's been created recently um, from a science fiction perspective? Oh boy. Um, actually, I, I haven't read that much of, of current, uh, mm. currently produced science fiction. And um, so I probably would do a bad, joy, uh, bad job um, trying to, to pick and choose among the, the, the people writing right now. Um, okay. Uh, I, let's see. The, the the one author that I'm really fond of that uh, uh, does not get the uh, the sort of cachet among the the golden age guys, even though he was, um, is uh, uh, the uh, let's see. He was the, he was the author of uh, Little Fuzzy, um, and uh, he, that he is known for that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and H -beam I, I, Piper. that is correct. Um, okay. but he, he wrote a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, in fact, the best of the, um, uh, par he called it paradigm, which is, which is, you know, uh, a universe mm. where all the possible time streams, you know, have, have are, are, you're able to travel back and forth between them, um, and but he had a he had a perspective on science fiction that most of the other writers didn't have. And the reason is that they were um, things like uh, Asimov was a chemist and um, Heinlein was a naval officer and, uh, and and that sort of thing. Well, he was a policeman. 
Uh, Piper was a, a, a private railroad policeman. And if you read his stuff knowing that, it, it just jumps out at you. He, he knows a lot more about that kind of thing. And, and um, his, uh, I mean, it, it, one of the things about literature in general is that the things that we really uh, grabbed us in, in literature and, 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 that, uh, uh, and that we remember it for is not the grand heroes and all that sort of stuff. It's the evil guys. It's the villains and the crooks and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so if you have much more um, graphically drawn, uh, believably drawn uh, villains, uh, then uh, you're going to write a, a, a much more compelling book. And so that's, uh, that's one of the things he does. Yeah. And I'm just on his Wikipedia page. I'm uh, self-educated. Um, yep. Very interesting, very interesting guy. Cool. I'll have to check some of those out. If uh, Andy Weir is a, a more contemporary author that I've enjoyed. You know, he wrote The Martian uh, and yes, more recently right. Hail Mary, mm -hmm. um, which I like. Right. It, it, at least mm -hmm. attempts to involve uh, and does a quite a rigorous job, I think, of, you know, involving the actual scientific method and some, <laughs> some reasonably appropriate math. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's I, not, I would, it's, it's not the hundred years out stuff that, uh, no, I, I would second that motion. Did. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, you know, Good. It's, just, it's a, it's a tough, a really tough job to, um, to get that scientifically accurate and get a hundred years out. I mean, you just can't do it. Um, yeah. But, uh, but it's but it's it's fun to try and uh, you know when when you every generation grows up reading about the dreams of the previous one you know it, it does sort of continue to cascade things and we're we're seeing you know everybody work on uh, VR now sort of guided by Ernest Klein mm -hmm. in Ready Player One um, a software version but uh, yeah I, I think we underestimate the power of sci-fi and um, to to show us what's possible and what we should strive for. Yeah, or uh, Neil Stevenson um, mm -hmm. in uh, what was the what was the one with the uh, um, the Deliverator where where he is the pizza delivery guy and the um, uh, the snow the, snow crash snow crash yeah that's the one yeah um, that yeah he he has a you know a a, a VR world overlying you know a, a, a really interestingly fractured. Uh, remains of the United States. Uh, yeah. And that was, and you know, 30 years ago, I think that he yeah. published that. Yeah. Well, yeah. the interesting thing is that that idea, I mean, not that idea, the snow crash idea, the, mm -hmm. the one that there can be a computer virus that will invade a human mind mm -hmm. um, was in the zeitgeist of the science fiction writers and three different books came out that year making ah. that, that, and, and it, that was one of them. I think the other one was a uh, Hogan's giant star, and and uh, and I've forgotten the name of the other one. But you know, there, there were there were three books that year that had that as a premise. And it's like interesting. What? How did that yeah. happen all at once? <laughs> well, yeah, we see we see the same thing in movies sometimes. I guess I don't know how that happens, but it, it, competitive interest maybe the the Machiavelli effect again. Yeah, well, well um, that well that and uh, convergent evolution. Yeah. I've, I've got a few. Um, I, I would love to keep you all day, uh, but I, I'm sure you have somewhere else to be. Uh, so I've got a few closing questions for you if you're up for a few more. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I would be very curious sort of uh, where you, how you look at where you were coming into this book, what your priors were, and some of the things that you maybe changed your mind on in the course of, you know, your, your eight years working on this. Um, well, I would say the... Big one is I, I came in with, with a bunch of questions like, you know, is a flying car actually going to be technologically feasible? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, what happened and all that sort of stuff. And then I've, I've described how um, I realized that, that you know, there, there was a problem with energy, but I had not realized just how clean cut and critical it was um, mm -hmm. and ran into things like the, the Henry Adams curve and so forth. Um, so uh, the the other things, I mean, uh, the uh, the Machiavelli effect, you know that that came from Machiavelli, you know, 500 years ago, um, 
So that's always been there. Still that's plaguing nothing, us. Yeah, we yeah. haven't solved that one yet. Yeah, that's nothing new. Um, but uh, the notion that that the the population uh, came over some kind of a watershed to make them into the the, the Eloi and the Eloi agonistes um, in the '60s and '70s um, uh, took form as I was as I was doing the uh, uh, the the writing and and the analysis. Um, and then, and then the other, the other really neat thing was, uh, um, travel theory. I mean, most of, mm. most of the, of the really cool stuff in the, in, in the book, you know, I, I didn't invent all this stuff, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I read a lot. Um, but, uh, um, the, the notion that, that you could actually sit down and, and calculate how much a flying car would be worth, um, also, yeah. you know, was, was a, was a, a cool sort of a new thing, I think. That was a very interesting um, discovery to me. Yeah, too. The, the theory that basically humans travel an hour ish a day, regardless of the technology that they use to travel. So yeah, if you're I, walking, I had, yeah, you walk I, an hour a day, and you only travel so far. If you got a car, if you got a flying car, I thought that was very yeah. interesting. And I hadn't, like, I hadn't known that either. But there it is. I mean, it was, yeah, it's just right there in the literature. Fascinating. It's like yeah, like the induced demand of you know, you make a bigger freeway, and more people take it, and it ends up just as mo- just as yeah. clogged, and takes just as long. Mm-hmm. Um, the, now that you've dropped the Eloy agonistes, uh, you, you're going to have to treat us to a definition of that for those who haven't read the book yet. Ah, well, basically, the Eloy um, are the degenerated remains of humanity in the H.G. Wells novel, uh, The Time Machine. Um, and he figured, you know, that that hundreds of centuries uh, down the road, um, once you had civilization, people are not going to need uh, their their strength and their aggression and, and all the other things that. Um, especially back in his day, were considered the, the manly virtues, um, and so people would just, you know, lose them, and 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 they would all become sort of uh, uh, big uh, children, basically, um, and uh, and and just be uh, run around like chickens and be scared of everything, and and, and so forth. <laughs> and, but um, you know, you look at you look at the real world, and and that's not exactly how people are. In fact, they're, they're worse now than they were before uh, because they all think they're, they have to do something uh, horrible, uh, horribly important to save the world. Um, and uh, so, and, and again, I'm not the first person to come up with this idea, but the, the idea is that um, as you move up um, the uh, scale, uh, the Maslow hierarchy of needs where um, you're not, you're, well, one of the ways I, I, I like to put it is uh, at, at, at roughly $30,000 um, per person income, uh, you quit worrying about how to make ends meet and you start worrying about how to keep your friends from eating meat. Um, and that's uh, you know, basically the, the, the kind of concerns that, that our grandparents had are just not the concerns we have because we take – the grandparents' concerns for granted, and and that's kind of what changed the zeitgeist in the '60s and '70s. Yeah, we spend more time in sort of the the social strata, which is a zero sum game, than we do in the you know pursuit of just feeding ourselves and staying alive. And to your point, these are related. I think in the book you say like you know the the world in which we stop innovating and stop growing becomes very zero sum and becomes very contentious and politically and socially savage. If we do not have a collective mission to continue to sort of grow and expand, then we just start eating each other um, and, and holding each other's heads down. The truth. Absolutely. Yeah. The truth, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and history shows us that. And, you know, if, if there's a, if there's a more compelling reason to continue to work on technology and innovation and growth and, um, continue to expand our purview and get back to supporting population growth and supporting energy growth. Um, it's understanding that, you know, that the, the other path is crabs in a bucket and us all trying to like scuttle over each other. Cause that is the default of human nature without a continuously growing pie. Yes, absolutely. And, and I mean, just look out there. I mean, the, mm-hmm. you know, this is, this is the tiny grain of sand and in, in the solar system, much less the universe. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if we just sit here, uh, and, 
keep giving up any chance we have of, of uh, building a, a capable technology, you know, the next, next big, big asteroid that comes along or uh, the next big solar flare or the next nearby um, uh, supernova. And, and, you know, it's, it's goodbye. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, as if you, if you believe in the, the value of humanity as a, as a thing in itself, um, which I do, uh, then, you know, we, we need to get out there. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, there's the humanity species level loyalty. Um, but there's a little even closer to home. If, if it's hard to abstract that, to care about the whole species, just think, you know, if your kids are the most important thing to you and you want them to have a good life and you want the, if their kids are the most important thing to them, you may not care about your own great, 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 great grandchildren, but this chain of leaving a slightly better world for the people that you care about the most, um, is, is unbroken. And the closest thing we have to, a, you know, are aligning with our genetic drives and our sort of built in motives. Um, we can, we can all do well to see this as the playbook for, for winning that game. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're a drop of water in the Mississippi river, you don't know where you're going, but you just keep going to the next spot and you yeah. know, ultimately, ultimately you get there. But, uh, and, and that's what it is like to be a human being, you know, you, you know, a direction you just, you know, but you don't know a destination. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you've got a number of other books, which, uh, now that I've read this, I'm, I plan to go, go read those, um, mostly focused on nanotechnology, I believe. Um, well, actually, actually one is nanotech and the other one is, uh, AI robotics. Um, oh, okay. And the, and the AI robotics one was actually the first, uh, book to address the question of, um, uh, you know, are the robots going to, you know, wake up and, and take us over and wipe us out or something? Um, and, uh, and I called it um, uh, Ethics for Machines, and they wouldn't let me use that title. So, but, so, but we came up with a title. Anyway, it's called Beyond AI. And, um, yeah. But it was the first book in, in what's now considered the field of uh, uh, AI safety. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, I was way ahead of my time. For 10 years, nobody – thought about it, talked about it, read the book, anything. And all of a sudden yeah. it's big, right? Um, so, uh, you know, it, don't, don't write a book that's that far ahead of its time, but nowadays, <laughs> well, 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 there's two reasons. One is that, you know, nobody's going to read it. And the other one is once you finally do get around to read it, um, you'll find that Everything's I, changed. I spend the first third of the book trying to convince the reader that AI is in fact possible. <laughs> Because you know that the, the the leadership has will have changed in their in their back underlying beliefs. So yeah. yeah. So so so, it, so it's it's a kind of a cool little history of AI to to start the book off. Yeah. Are are you concerned now with uh with the risk of general AI? I I don't think so. I, I think basically okay. um, AI is going to be like any other powerful technology, and it's clear that if you uh, set out to, to do something dangerous with it, like any other technology, um, you could do something very dangerous and, and, and so forth. But um, the, the technology itself is, is kind of neutral the same way that, that other technologies are. And in yeah. fact, the uh, AI is, is the first one that actually has the, the possibility of being uh, – net good um mm. and 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 actually good on its own if if we build ais that that can have what we would consider good morals um then they will be a force for good in the world and um i came to the conclusion when i was was writing the book that it's probably the case that if we actually can produce ais that are intelligent they have common sense that can use language the way we do you know all, all this sort of stuff then it's not going to be that hard to put in the conscience because you know you, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to understand but mm -hmm. over the course of the 20th century moral philosophers ultimately came to the conclusion and and, and this is just the standard way of seeing things now that the 
language ability and the ethics ability are very similar in, in, in human minds. Um, mm. And so if you can do uh, uh, language, you can do ethics and vice versa. Fascinating. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will be, I'll be reading that. I will read your nanotech book. Um, are, are there other, um, I don't know, authors or resources? Like w where else would you point uh, someone like me who is hungry for more things, uh, thinkers and people like you who have this sort of optimistic, technologically driven view of the future and uh, show us all that's all that's possible? Um. Well, there, there's there's a kind of a, a new field that that calls itself progress studies, um, mm. and it it I think the word came from uh, Tyler Cowen, the economist, um, mm -hmm. and uh, some various uh, things that that he's been supporting. Um, so if you, you just sort of uh, search around and and look for that, you'll find most of the people that uh, I would be able to point you at. Yeah. Oh, and, and my uh, wife is uh, calling me. Um, <laughs> I have a tennis match I got to get to. So, um, okay. We kind of want to wrap up here. Sure. No. Yeah. Um, what last question then a dangerous question for an author, but, uh, I would love to know what else you're, you're working on or, or what's next for you and what we can look forward to. Um, well, I don't know if you can look forward to it. I'm, I'm trying to write a science fiction story. Um, oh, fantastic. Heaven only knows if I, if I'm anywhere uh, close to competent at that because I've not tried it before. I have, a, I have a wild hair to do that myself someday. Uh, so I, I sympathize with, uh, you know, the, the feeling of entering a new field. Um, but it's, a, it's an exciting one. I, I look forward to reading it. Um, I'm sure many more people do. Thank you so much, Josh, for, for taking the time to talk with us and share the book. And, um, I, I really, I can't encourage people to read it highly enough. I, I hope it, uh, I hope it puts a dent in, uh, the trajectory of our future. And I think it very well could. So thank you for, for all your contributions. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a blast and uh, see you around. All right. Okay. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Josh. All right. Bye.